We are kicking off a bit of a mini-series on, on things that programmers find essential. And uh, it'd be great to find out what you think is essential. <laughs> sure. Lots of things that are essential. Do you want to narrow the scope of that a little bit? I mean, so, coffee is essential. Uh, <laughs> so within programming, I mean, you, you, you want to tell us about some kind of array. Is that true? Is that yes. The, I guess I would say that I wanted to talk primarily about associative arrays, which are in other contexts called hash tables, or sometimes in a language like uh, Python, they're called dictionaries. The idea is an array which has as its subscripts, not integers from zero or one up to something, but rather any arbitrary thing is the subscript of the array. And so this gives you a great deal of flexibility. You can build really interesting things with associative arrays. I will call them associative arrays. If you think hash table, if you're a Java or JavaScript programmer, let's say, or if you think uh, dictionary for Python people, it's the same basic thing. So the idea is instead of having subscripts which go from, let's call it zero, to something, you have arbitrary subscripts. And for simplicity, let's just call them strings of characters, just text words like Sean or Dave or Steve. So let's give people a bit of context there. Uh, we have our, our <laughs> film crew in, uh, in full effect. So if I understand rightly, then that means instead of keeping track on, you know, number 13 was the number that I gave to the number of whatever, then instead it can say nails or screws or whatever. Correct. Yeah, one of the classic examples of this thing is that you want to keep track of, for example, oh, your groceries that you might buy. So we were buying things like beer and pizza and coffee and chips, this sort of thing. And so what you'd like to do is have an array where the subscripts are beer and pizza and chips and coffee or whatever else. And then the values of those array elements can be whatever you want, but they might be, for example, how much you spent on beer and pizza and coffee. And so you could write a very simple program that would simply say, I have pizza, 10 pounds, beer, 20 pounds, coffee, two pounds, beer, 20 pounds. And I would like to just add up all of the things for the, the pizza, all of the things for the beer separately and so on. And so I, I would simply add that, add numeric values to what you see in the array at those subscripts that are, instead of being numbers, are just the strings, beer, pizza. I think it's a lot easier in many respects. And so easy to use this stuff, very natural, I think, for many people. And it turns out the implementation is actually quite simple as well. It took, I imagine, in computer science a while for people to realize how to do it well. And now I think people really do understand how to make effective, efficient implementations of associative arrays. So I don't know whether I could perhaps draw a picture that would be useful, that would give somebody an idea of how sure. you do this. Yeah, Let me try. Yeah, let's have a look. Let's suppose I have an array, let's just call it X because I have no imagination. And I would like to say, okay, the element here is pizza. And I could say, how much pizza did I buy? Well, 20 pounds worth of pizza or something like that. Or maybe it was 20 pizzas, doesn't matter. And so I can say X of beer equals 10 and so on. And then I could later on say, well, x of beer equals x of beer plus 15. So these are the ways that you would use these in a program with all of the advantages. And they look just like the subscripts that you would find if these were integers instead, like pizza were one and beer were two and so on. But this is a lot more natural. So that's kind of the use of this. How would you actually build one of these things? The internal representation is often uh, and this is where it really hash table is probably the right way to think of it. Suppose we have in memory somewhere an honest to God array of the sort that we're familiar with where the subscripts go from zero, one, two, dot, 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 up to whatever, some number n like this. This is going to be the hash table where you can find things. And what happens is if I want to find the particular place in this table where elements associated with, let's say, pizza are stored, then what I do is I take pizza and I run it through a hash, which scrambles it up in some way and produces a number which is between zero and, in this case, let's call it n, okay? So the hashing 
takes this, scrambles it. You could imagine doing just by adding up the letters, as treat them as numbers, add them up, and you get some value, and then you use the modulus function to reduce it so that it's in this range. And that tells you, oh, the pizza stuff is going to be stored here, but you don't store it in the table. What you do is that you have typically something that says, I'm pizza, and my current value is 20. This is getting a little too small, and this simply points to it. Okay, so now somebody comes along later on and wants to say, where is pizza stored in the array? What I do is I same process, I say, okay, take pizza, run it through the hash function, gives me a number, let's call it in this case two, and I say, oh, okay, the pizza guy is there. Okay, so that's the basic thing. But what happens if something else by accident of the hashing collides with Pizza. Maybe beer collides with pizza. I mean, they go well together. So what happens there is that the data structure is really a linked list. And so if it turns out that by accident, beer also, when run through the hash, comes out as two. So this is called a hash collision. So what you have to do there is to say, well, there's really a data structure a little more complicated and points off to something that says beer, which is at this point 25, let's say. And so when I want to look up beer, I simply start at the front here and I say, pizza, no, that's not beer. Ah, there's beer. And now I'm all set. And there's also something that says there's no more in this list. And if another thing comes along that happens to also collide with this, then no problem, we just make the list longer. So then what you have to do, this hashing function here has to have the property that you give it a bunch of different things like beer, pizza, coffee, Coke, whatever, it should spread those things fairly uniformly across the table so that you don't get everybody piling up in this particular element, but you get mostly these little chains of things about the same length. And that means that the access to the information in this table is sort of constant time. You do the hash function, it tells you where to go, and there's usually only one or two elements in any given chain of things that happen to have the same hash value. You know, suppose that this is small, maybe n is only 10, and you've got hundreds of different things in the table, n has to be bigger. And so what you can do at that point is you can actually grow the table. You can say, okay, let's just rehash everything in sight and make a new table. I'm going to switch to a new page here so we can see it. The fanfold's gonna throw you now. The fanfold has thrown me. <laughs> I remember fanfold from my youth, but... So here we have this hash table that went from zero up to some old value of n like this. Mm -hmm. And we've got things in it like my pizza and my beer and so on. And suppose that it's gotten very crowded at this point. If n was small and I've got lots of things, it's gonna get crowded necessarily. So what I can simply do is to say, well, let me make a new table that's twice as big, four times, it doesn't matter, something that's a lot bigger, and simply take every element that I find here, whatever it might be, compute its new hash value and just stick it into this table instead. And so with a different value here, you might find that pizza is here, but beer is down here. They're no longer linked together, quite possible, because this value would determine where they're put. And so if I've changed so that this is, let's say, a table of 2n or something like that, they might hash differently, might hash the same too. And so now you can see that on the average, the chains are going to be half as big. And I only do this once in a while when the table starts to get full. And maybe I make it four times as big. And so at all times, the access to information in this hash table is pretty much constant time. You come in, you hash it, and very short look down a list, and you're done. Once you've made this new table, of course, then you can throw away the information from that one. So is the modulo, or the amount has been modulo by the end? Yes, right, exactly, yeah. I, I mean, I've been careless because we started at zero and we went up to n, and so that's really n plus one element, so you have to be a little cautious there. That's a classic kind of error that programming <laughs> programmers, other programmers might make. I would never do that, <laughs> but, but that's the idea. And, and then, of course, the details of what's a good hashing function and how to make that really spread arbitrary information around is still kind of a, you've got to be careful to get it right, but there's an awful lot of good guidance. And so for the most part, it just works fine. And, and this is very simple to implement the amount of code in pick your favorite programming language is probably a few tens of lines of code at most. It's very compact, very easy to do. You do it once and then you say, okay, now I understand how that stuff works and you don't have to think about it. You can use somebody else's implementation. So I was going to say, so some of this is, is you write yourself, but there will probably be libraries out there that do. Yeah, right. If you're in Java, there's a class, what is it, hash table or something like that. I think I've forgotten exactly. In Python, there's the 
subscript dictionary that looks like that. In Perl, there's a hash, <laughs> literally a hash, and so on. These kinds of things, I've got too many of them in my head. They blur, especially under pressure. And so I would uh, have to go and look to be sure. But that's the essence of it. Self-publication is a recipe for having things disappear without a trace. And so that the first edition did sort of disappear without much trace. The second edition was published by Princeton University Press, who also has an arrangement with uh, Oxford University Press. And so I'm hopeful that the book gets a lot more uh, publicity.